Shabbat Shalom, everyone, uh, and to all those who are joining us on the uh, on the video and everybody who's joined us here live. Uh, again, you're welcome to come and join us uh, every uh, Shabbat at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And uh, if you want to come and see us, just go to the website, rivershabbat.com, scroll down, click subscribe on the newsletter, and put in your email address, first and last name. And uh, if you're if you do that, we'll, you'll receive our weekly newsletter, and that has the link to our live gathering uh, every week at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, so uh, if you're inclined and led to join us, then you're more than welcome. Uh, wonderful family here, and uh, we'd love to have you. Okay, the great judgment. The books were opened. And uh, we've got Michael joining us in the uh, teaching here and uh, on the videos. And uh, one of the reasons for that, I was saying earlier that um, in the fires of my life, there were some things that the Father uh, revealed and put in my spirit um, to various degrees and things that I've not talked too openly about for many years. Uh, but we're getting to a time where he's putting in our spirit for us to do so. And as a part of that, it brings in discipleship and fellowship. And so Michael and I did some what we call swims together around some of these things. And in doing so, um, he further uh, built upon and, and revealed things. And so we, uh, we've been chewing the cud and testing whether some of these things be so. And out of that, we decided that, well, look, let's, let's, uh, you know, let's share a bit of this with the uh, with the wider community. So, hence, we are doing the Great Judgment series on River Shabbat. What say you, Michael? Oh, I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, again, it, the, the swim, the, the journey in the swims was really interesting. You know, you, you start, you, you see a little thread somewhere, and you start tugging at it, and before you know it, this whole thing comes out. And you know, just when we think that's it you know we're trying to put the teaching together and the father just goes oh try looking here and yeah it's just been an amazing journey and really looking forward to sharing it with the community amen amen um and so this is a little bit of what we do like when we enjoy our swims together as we call them and this is all just a terminology we use for you know a bit more intimate and a bit more accountable um discipleship environments which we believe in and uh, and submit ourselves to and things like that. As a part of that, we believe that the Ruach blesses us as a, as a part of that. And he's with us because not that we're perfect and that we do everything perfectly, but, you know, I think we have a father who loves Troyer. <laughs> and so as we try to, you know, at least have a little bit of his pattern in our life, I, I think you know, he's everything is a good loving father's trying to do is um, maybe go, yeah, I'm with you, you know? Um, and so he's with us despite us. And so we we go through and we do things like uh, like this. And so we're going to share a little bit of that with you. Um, and like I say, maybe three or four part series, whatever it might be. But the idea is, um, is as we do the journey, just to kind of incrementally just look at these things um, in stages as we've been led to share. And uh, and we'll see where it goes. We've had a little bit of a a uh, little bit of a longer time together as a community in the notices and song and things like that today. So not quite sure whether we're going to get through all of part one today, because we won't, we don't want it getting too long um, for each part, but uh, we'll just see how we go today and, uh, and see where it takes us. So the books were opened, the great judgment. We're going to start off here. Um, Michael, I'll get you to, I'll get you to read, read the quote here from Timothy Shriver. To be unafraid of the judgment of others is the greatest freedom you can have. Mr. Shriver, uh, I've got here, he's been, you know, part of the chairman of the Special Olympics and uh, he's a executive uh, officer of Unite and things like that. Interesting enough, he's part of the extended Kennedy family. He also has a lot to do with, it, you know, being a vaccine champion and influencer in the whole realm around this COVID-19 stuff and just a lot of interesting stuff going on. So why would we include this kind of a statement? And, and again, this is a statement, I believe, that is reflects Rome. <laughs> it really reflects Rome with how we're, we're, we're so caught up in this position because basically whether when I say Rome, it's the euphemism for those outside the camp, maybe unbelieving, secular, whatever it is. But basically, in Rome, you get to sit on the throne of your life, um, whatever that is. And so 
uh, if you're God, if you're the throne of your life, then, you know, you, you don't want to, as a God, be worried about the judgment from other gods. <laughs> and so you end up with, um, with statements like this. But I've got here, well, what about Elohim? What about God? If you were to apply that to your creator, does that hold true? You see, when we look at the word, it really does point to, uh, you know, and as Solomon pointed to, that we are to have a fear of Elohim. And that fear of Elohim, according to the word, is actually the beginning of wisdom. But if you applied this kind of methodology and you had no belief system, you had no reverence to your creator, there is no way that you're going to walk in a wise way. And so one of the things that we want to start off with doing this is we're going to preface some things. We're going to look at just something interesting in what's called a chiastic menorah structure today. It's just, just to let you know there's a world out there that does not fear God. And ultimately, it will not walk in wisdom. And as, as nice as this man is or may be and a lot of the good work he's done and all these kinds of things, again, if this was about intelligence and being kind and being nice, but if you're on the throne of your life and your fear is in yourself dying, your fear is not in a reverence to Elohim, you will start to act unwisely. And it won't matter what your level of education is, your influence, your wealth, your all these sorts of things. And so if we don't think of judgment in a healthy, reverent way, we can get ourselves into trouble. Is that fair, Michael? Absolutely. And unfortunately, this type of ideology has crept in to the body, you know, either because people think, well, we're the chosen ones, and we're all going to sit on Yeshua's lap in the millennial reign, or the the because we're more Roman than we are believer, if that makes sense, just because we're 2000 years removed. And again, this creeps into the body. And the result is not walking in wisdom. And there's consequences to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to start off with here. Revelation 20, 11, 12. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, the earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged. And what was written in the books according to what they had done. The word there, white being used in the Greek is uh, leokos or lukos. Um, bright, brilliant, or whiteness, a dazzling whiteness, an exalted of splendor. I got heavenly state here shining. Um, interesting enough, it also points to white garments worn on a festive estate occasions and now just everybody take note of that because <laughs> it's kind of an interesting allusion to something sign of purity and, and innocence michael i've got here not the bema seat not the judgment seat of messiah what say you well i think those of the those who have been part of the community for a while will understand some of the uh things we've taught and that this what this scripture here revelation 20 is speaking of the judgment at the end of the millennial reign this is we're talking about the second death or eternal life here we're not talking of the bema seat which is a rewards and losses judgment for the believer for the deeds they've done in the body as paul would say and this bema seat we have to really understand that this happens just prior to the millennial reign uh, we really want people to understand the difference between the Bema seat and what we're going to be teaching on the, in this series, which is the great white throne judgment after the thousand years. Yeah. So we're going to just lay the foundation for that uh, as we go forward. Of course, everything we do, again, um, those of us who have been with us or watched the teacher will be familiar with everything we do is in the framework of the Moedim or the appointed times, including looking at, obviously, uh, what would be key biblical judgments. Um we believe that that is the only way to do it, whether you're looking at judgments, whether you're looking at things prophetically, because all of these things are pointing to our Messiah. 
And so this was the way we were taught in the Torah, which was to view or the structure of how we were to view the lens in which we were to view our faith and to ultimately uh, um, draw closer to our Messiah was through the very appointed times or Moedim's dress rehearsal that would become appointed times that were fulfilled, that continue, that we honor, that we understand, that teach us who he is. This isn't actually that difficult or complicated. What makes it complicated is that we've all learned a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> and if we just actually done it the way he asked us to, it wouldn't be complicated. But because we've not lived a life in the simplicity of Messiah and understanding his uh, Moedim, his appointed time structure, we've got all of this other stuff and 30,000 plus denominations and all manner of Christian Talmud and Jewish Talmud. And, you know, everybody's running around in various places. So again, everything we speak about, you know, is through in a framework of appointed times. Now, interestingly enough here in this one, we've got, we're getting to, uh, um, we go through this period where we get the actual fulfillment of the fall moedim now if you have if you don't understand this sort of thing or or this kind of talk is new to you go back and look at a lot of uh, the other teachings you'll find both in all branch and river shabbat where we teach and speak of all of these things from an appointed time framework this is particularly going to be leading up from following a, uh, a time of the beam of seed following the time of the seeds and goats judgment. And now we're heading into an actual last day, this last, uh, this thousand year reign days of a thousand years and a thousand years, but of a day. And it ends uh, with a very interesting event, which we just read in scripture, this great right throne and the time domain comes to an end. Now I can't stress this enough. Time is done quarantine is over. It is the final and last judgment as a part of the whole great plan of redemption, which is laid out in the appointed times. We are speaking of the end of the last age of the great plan of redemption, and it ends with a great white throne. And to really un let people know, you know, some of the discussions when Curtis and I were discussing this is, this is it, like you can't go beyond this, right? You can maybe get glimpses or anything like that, but we're talking, this is as far as we've been given really within the scriptures. Uh, we get little peaks here and there, but beyond to, to go beyond this and, and may, be dogmatic on it is kind of folly. Uh, we're really, we're literally knocking at the end here of what we can, we've been given. And scripture even tells us beyond this point, it's above our pay grade. You know, we, we can't actually conceive what he has in store for those who know and love Messiah. So there's a, it's almost a bridal picture in that statement in how it reflects it in scripture. And yet if that's a bridal position, it's saying, even if you're selected as the bride of Messiah, you don't really, you can't really go beyond this point in the time domain. And so whenever we hear talk outside of that and whatnot, and, and I kind of laugh with this at the guys over the years and at myself and everything else, is we're talking about things way beyond our pay grade. We're in imagination land when you start getting into that, that spectrum. But anything up to this final point of the of 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 we're at the end of the time domain, the new Jerusalem's coming out, and we're actually going to be hitting out of the time domain where we're no longer in quarantine in this thing we call time. We are given things, in fact, instructions, you know, to ask, to seek out to find the pearls of great price, to, to do these things. Um, you know, uh, again, you know, his, his glory of Elohim to conceal a matter and the honor of Kings to search out. There's a process in which the, the you know, uh, our God is wanting us to live and to test us in the time domain as to where we're going to go. What are we going to do? Are we interested in his plan? Are we interested in him? I'm wanting to hear our plan. <laughs> you know, and I don't know about you, Michael, but, you know, it took the fires of my life where I started to realize he wasn't interested in my plan. He, he wanted me to be interested in his plan. And um, I think we got 30,000 plus denominations that might want to take that up uh, as an understanding right now that what we've been guilty of. Potentially in our religious dogma. Is we're trying to get him 
to march to our imagination. And yet this is his dream. It's his plan of redemption. It's his goal. It's his fantasy. It's his creation. We got to get this the right way around of who's been invited to what here. <laughs> what do you say, Michael? Yeah, we like to make this faith about um, I'm the house of Israel or I will have eternal life. I, 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 you know, what's in it for me? And um, yeah, th th that's a real stickler. It takes time to really get out. And the more you realize, you know, the more you seek, the more you knock and the more he answers, you realize, wow, it is far greater than we could have ever made it up to be or even, you know, and the more you understand his plan, the more you think, I should probably take a step back, maybe fall on my face. <laughs> well, it, and again, this is what we go through. And, and, and it's easy to just get caught up with, you know, the struggles of life, our thoughts, our, you know, our knowledge, everything else. So that's not a contending thing. But a part of why we do these kind of things and why we share this together and walk through this as a family is to encourage us to go, OK, OK, it's OK to look at these things a little bit deeper, dig around, let's test whether these things be so, everything else. Uh, you know, we're not playing with the foundation of our faith in the Torah, and we're not going to throw away the blood of the bud, don't worry. You know, and we can only go so far, but the Father has given us a safe confines in which to dig around. <laughs> okay, he's, he's actually telling us, dig, dig, dig. And it's funny, he will join us if we'll do it even reasonably close to how he's asked us to. <laughs> and I've found over the years that it's interesting how the Ruach joins in on the swims or in the, in the discipleship or in the iron sharpens iron. And it's wonderful. We don't want to live without that process. Um, so that we don't become, you know, the Tibetan monks sitting on hilltops, you know, claiming, you know, I've heard from God um, and all that kind of thing. That's not the direction we want to go. We want to do this as a body and chew the cut and uh, walk these things out, especially matters as serious as what we're discussing right now. We are discussing the great white throne. It says here, Michael, I'll get you to read this one. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servants be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Mm. Now, this is big. This is big. How far does this go? And this is a question that... This is the question that all of us must contend with if we care. If we don't care, we'll probably never ask this question. Is that fair, Michael? Absolutely. You know, we, we think, come follow me from our religious journey. And we just think, oh, you know, put away your struggles in the flesh. Be nice to people, you know, <laughs> d do someone a favor. Let them jump in front of the line in front of it. And it's like, no, like this goes so deep. And hopefully this series will give people a glimpse of really how far the statement come follow me really goes we are in an incredible time of having as daniel prophesied of having his righteousness increase right at the end of the age we're just in an incredible time to be able to dig around it's like he's allowing things to be understood and known you know in these bookends um I believe the Apostle Paul was actually privy to such a level of understanding that this is where, you know, unless you walk to them closely and discipled with them and whatnot, you know, just like Yeshua was, he would stump the Sanhedrin, you know, they would go away in wonderment after, you know, and Yeshua would ask a few questions and give a few statements and these guys would be going away. These are some of the most knowledgeable people in the Torah and the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, because that's all they had then, that have ever lived. And they're in wonderment. So what is going on here? What was the level at which Yeshua, what did he give to his Talmudin, to his disciples that changed the course of the world? What was it that Paul understood following the Damascus Road? Why was it that we have both Christians and our brethren in, in Judah both have this in common? They twist his words. Is it because possibly neither side under, actually understands them? And is it possible that it is only through the power of the Ruach that any of us possibly ever could? Is it possible this isn't about intelligence, Mike? Or knowledge, as we understand it? Is it more about our heart, our desire, yeah. our integrity? 
I don't think he's a respecter of men, according to the, the Elohim I know and, and, and his word. I don't think any of us impress him, at least knowledge-wise. So if he's not a respecter of men, and he's certainly not impressed with your eyes' knowledge, what is it? Why would he speak to us? Why would he share to any of us? Is it possible what we're actually looking at here is a, you know, a bridegroom-groom uh, relationship perspective and that's is what he's desiring and of course this is what we weave in all throughout all the teachings um to constantly bring it back to this position of you know um this uh, drawing closer uh, to him and not making him up in our own imagination and so uh we're constantly in this tension um the english definition of judgment here an opinion, a decision that is based on careful thought, the ability to make considered decisions or come to sensible conclusions, an opinion or conclusion, the ability to make good decisions. But what should be done using our best judgment, um, whether you show bad judgment or you show a lack of judgment, we'll all come through a process of actually working through a matter. Now, what's interesting, Michael, uh, and is that we, I've got up here judgment or judgment. Which, which one is it? I, I know which one offends me. Just so everybody knows um, that uh, in the UK, they will, they will spell judgment with, with an E. And of course, they claim the mastery of the English language and that we're all over here in North America bastardizing it. Um, <laughs> um, so maybe they can lay claim to that. They were first to uh, come to the trans, uh, the, 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 the English sort of uh, development of, of how this was all going to play out. Nonetheless, in North America, we drop the E generally. Now, not so much in Canada from a Commonwealth perspective. We tend to keep the E. I personally spell it with an E, Michael, just so you know. You must However, be set apart then. <laughs> I must be set apart. However... Here's the point, and this is the play on words here. We're using judgment without an E for the sake of this series, just so that we don't have, you know, people even thinking there's a spelling mistake in that sense, and now we're looking at judgment. But it's more, too, that you work through it and go, is it judgment or judgment? And when you think about judgment, most of us confuse judgment with sentencing. Would that be fair, Michael? Yeah. And unfortunately, again, this goes back to this thing, because we don't understand judgment, you get quotes like you just mentioned at the beginning from our Roman friend over there. And again, this creeps into the body and you'll hear, you know, don't judge me, don't judge me. But then Paul will say, well, do you not judge those who are inside? So what is it that we're missing? Yeah. And this is the thing that we're, we're going to press upon that you have learned that judgment equals sentencing. You've not understood and at least we weren't raised with this generally in a Western sense, that judgment is a part of the process of working out that will lead to sentencing. And so this, again, can be, uh, you know, leaven and understanding the house and these sorts of things. So when, when we're seeing a transliteration of the word judgment in scripture, we've got a number of things now here to consider because we're 2000 years later, and then we've learned it a certain way in the West and so on and so on and so on. And so we're trying to get to truth, not our current cognitive dissonance or confirmation bias that we're seeking according to whatever our level of understanding, culture or education that we have. And so this is what we're always uh, being challenged with as such as we seek truth. Okay, judging amongst ourselves. We're going to just give a little example of this. So, and we got, and we have to lay the framework and the foundation for a number of things here because it's actually being done in scripture. And there's a reason we believe for this as well. I say this to your shame. Can it be? There's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers. This is 1 Corinthians 6 5 that we're uh, putting this up from. The word here in the Greek is diakrino. That's being used for settle a dispute. Very interesting. It's, this means to separate, make a distinction, discriminate, to prefer, to learn uh, in this way, to, to lead to a place of um, working through judgment. This is the place of, I guess, in simple terms, it'd be working through a matter. And so this is what Paul's doing. He's saying, I say this to your shame. He's actually addressing this matters going on in the church of Corinth at this time. And they're working through, they got all sorts of shenanigans going on. And Paul's writing them to him in, in a matter. And he, in, in the trans, uh, the, the translation here uh, uh, from the Greek is diacrino. 
And this is this working through a matter sort of um, thing. Michael, you got any comments on that one before we keep building this picture? Well, it, it's a fairly, you know, like you said, it's working through a matter and, and may the audience, you know, understand what, what the process it takes to work a matter out from start to completion. This is what this diacrino is saying. It's covering the whole process. You could even say that iron sharpens iron would be a part of that to yeah. a certain degree. Exactly. So the diacrino is the word they're being used here, but yet in the Greek, we've got crino. Now, this is interesting because this can bring in or lead to or end with actual judicial decisions where we're actually going to form and pass judgment. So if we don't know which position we're reading, because everything in the English, both in the Hebrew, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and the Greek, you know, and, and being transliterated uh, into the English, we just see judgment, 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 judgments. We talk about this, like, you know, they say the same thing with the word love, right? You know, that'd be another example, you, you know, okay, so what's the context of the word being used here and so on and so on. So that can be, um, and so we got these challenges. It's like uh, the word help. You know, it's like, well, are we dealing with Sheol? Are we dealing with Gahana? Are we dealing with the lake of, you know, everything's just hell in scripture. And of course, if you don't, and then of course, what's your understanding of hell? And then you're reading that. And again, we're reading into something. We, we need to know what is the true context or understanding when it comes to judgment. It's not Michael or I's view that matters here. What matters here is the author's understanding. What was their context? viewing this from a Hebraic culture 2000 years ago um, and, and how they worked through and how they dealt with matters. My 2000 years later in, you know, in a, you know, in a Western, you know, mindset um, really is not the thing I want to read into scripture. The word judgment in the English is about 170 times used in, in this thing we call the Bible. Now in the Hebrew sort of equivalent of diacrino is Dean. <laughs> so this is interesting. It's like, now this tends to be a very similar, you know, and as Michael had said, the iron sharpens iron, it's working through a matter. So the Dean that is used in the Hebrew uh, uh, text uh, is kind of the equivalent of this diacrino, um, you know, roughly. And it's the same with Mishpat to Krino. And again, this is the play where it starts to get to a place of actual decision that will lead to a sentencing or a judicial uh, matter. And so again, now, you know, when we read this in the Hebrew, the word judgment and things like this, and we're looking at our, you know, Old Testament, and we're doing this kind of thing. And it's like, well, is what am I looking at? Am I looking at working through the process? Or am I looking at the process that now is leading to judicial? And so this is important. And we need to make these distinctions as we look at not only some of the scriptures, but as we actually think about what was this Hebraic mindset in trying to process, um, you know, the process of how they worked out judgment, because it's not just is saying judgment, because sometimes where judgment is transliterated in the English, they're actually just in the working through a matter part. <laughs> they're not even anywhere near passing sentence. And is that would that be fair, Michael? Absolutely. I mean, the easy way to think of it in the Greek, diacrino will lead to krino. In the Hebrew, dean will lead to mishpat. You know, there's the process, uh, and we just call it all judgment <laughs> to our folly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it can just muddy the waters a little bit, right? In our thinking, and then we just apply it as we have learned it, whatever we think judgment is. But most, I know most people in the West don't think of judgment as working through a matter. They actually think of it as the passing sentence component only. Hmm. And that is the outcome of the judgment process is a sentencing, you know, uh, the consequence as such. I'll get you to read this, Michael, here. We're going to go to, we're going to go to King Solomon. This is the wisest man who's ever lived, according to Elohim. OK, so the wisest man who ever lived, we're going to see him um, deal with something here quite interestingly um, through a din process or a dean process. And he's working through something. So I'll get you to read this, Michael. Then the king said, the one who says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. And the other says, no, but your son is dead and my son is the living one. And the king said, bring me a sword. 
So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and give half to the other. Then the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, O oh my master, give her the living child and by no means put him to death. But the other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Mm. Now, the question to ask is, was Solomon going to literally divide the child in two? Or was he trying to expose something? He, he's using wisdom. He's using sound judgment and reasoning, for a lack of better words, to expose something so that he can then make an informed decision. He's going to go somewhere with this, isn't he? Yeah. So what's the part of the process that we're actually witnessing? Are we seeing sound judgment occurring here by Solomon? This is the question that, you know, we ask ourselves. Well, where does this all end? I'll read this one. Then the king answered and said, give the living child to the first woman. And by no means put him to death. She is the mother. Why? Why did that happen? Michael? He's, he's, now, he's now coming to the end of this, you know, diacrino, this dean. Yeah. And now he's, 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 he's making the, the, the consequence of the decision part of this now is coming into play. Why did he do that? Well, he's obviously exposed the matter to expose the truth of the matter. And from knowing the truth, you can then make a decision. And once you have all the facts, you can then make a sent. You can pass a sentence. You can make a judgment call, as we would say in the English. Now, the facts came through the reaction of the actual mother in this case, didn't it? Which we're not showing here in the scripture. But she's the real mother is going what? Just give him. She yeah. wants the child to live. Yeah. The real mother is, is doing what the nurture protector design will do, right? If, if it's going to, it, it all costs protect. And so even if that means I lose custody, essentially, this is before the king. And Solomon's wise enough to know that the, the, the actual design of men and women, <laughs> he knows that only the design of a true mother, that nurture protector, is going to do this. So the very process that he used in the din here, in the din, to, to literally expose, you know, what was in the woman's design. Now, if you didn't know truly the, the nurture protector reality of the, of the creator's design over a woman, you wouldn't even know to test or to diacrino or to deem this way. Is that fair, Michael? Absolutely. And this should start giving us a hint now as to what will be required for ultimately the greatest judgment that we read of in the time domain. I mean, we're seeing wisdom here. The, the, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. It finishes off here. And all Israel heard the judgment. The word here is mispah. So the mishpat judgment that the king had rendered and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived the wisdom of Elohim was in him to do justice. So the judicial matter of this was that it was going to stay with the actual mother. The consequence, the sentence had come out of a process. And so judgment was an outcome. It fell out of the process, the mishpat. And they're in awe of what they're seeing. And in our swim, what we were doing was saying, Solomon is demonstrating the process that's leading to the outcome, that's bringing about the final judicial or consequence of the matter, understanding the design of men and women, applying this into the process at a very extremely high, uh, um, um, capable of, you know, the, the wisdom being demonstrated here is stunning. And, it, and the, I've got the statement down there, Solomon is demonstrating both. In this process, it's leading to this judicial decision, this outcome where the true mother is going to retain her child. Thus reflects the shadow picture of the Melchizedek, the voice of the righteous king. This is the definition of Melchizedek. And what we are seeing here, they stood in awe as they perceived the wisdom of Elohim. 
Now, Michael and I and previous teachers, and you, you go and look at them, you'll, you'll see that what we're doing is we're making the argument that the voice of the righteous king or the order of Melchizedek is actually the bride of Messiah. And we're actually seeing a shadow picture here in the way Solomon is dealing with something from a throne position. This is important that we, uh, we, that we can understand it in this way. Okay, Michael, I'll get you to read this. Why does this matter? Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and, turn, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, or seven menorahs. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. Now, the seven branch menorah. Why are we going to the menorah on this? Is we believe that the menorah, and again, you, you know, you need to look through it all, but this being contained in the revelation of Messiah is reflecting the kahal, his assembly, his people. Ultimately, we believe from an overcoming position, ultimately the bride. So we've got this beautiful picture, and the, and the menorah, as we kind of understand it, originally was fashioned from the understanding of an almond tree. And so we've got this interesting play going on, but there's a chiastic structure to a menorah. What is that? Okay, we're going to look at some, we're going to look at something here because we're going to look at the great biblical judgments. Now there are many judgments in Scripture, various judgments and consequences and things like that. But we're going right up. We're going to the top of Mount Sinai here, and we're going to look at the judgments that are going to span human history, as in the key great biblical judgments. And they're very interesting when you do this, when we look at it from a chiastic structure in this, uh, in this menorah sense. And so we're using this kind of pattern, um, uh, biblical pattern of understanding uh, the word and the scripture, because it can point to us and give us really interesting insights. Michael? Just so people know what a chiastic structure is, it's think of it as a b c d and then it goes it does the same but in reverse the other side so basically yeah. it all points to the middle so it goes from the outer edges and comes in and there's a focus always on the middle point that you know the father wants us to look at this and there's a and there's a linkage as you go in reverse you know yeah. and so this is where that beautiful picture is seen uh in a menorah um and so it's mentioned in the revelation of Messiah. And so we're applying a basic sort of structure into going and looking at the great biblical judgments and going, is there a chiastic structure here? And so, and, uh, and this was one of the things that I discovered uh, in the sense of looking at the great biblical judgments long ago, but looking at it from the chiastic structure came out of uh, our chewing the, the cutout in this. And it was like, it was interesting. I'm going, this is fascinating. Uh, more than fascinating. Um, this is, you know, serious enough for us to be able to uh, delve deeper into his word on this matter. And so these great biblical judgments. Now, I'm going to say these judgments include, all include on these great blessings, the blessing of death. Now, you know, Curtis, the blessing of death, what are you talking about? You know, nowhere in scripture is death a curse. A curse is applied to the living. Okay, in, in this sense. And in fact, you would be cursed if you couldn't die right now in this current state. That would be a, a person who is cursed scripturally. Now, we've got this all wonky in our Western thinking and mindset and everything else. But when you go through the great book of Ecclesiastes, and you understand this. King Solomon actually understood this reality. And so it's, it's expressed. It's only us in the West that don't understand these things. And it's quite interesting when you kind of do the whole study on curse, isn't it? Uh, biblical curses, Michael, and you start realizing, wait a minute. <laughs> well, what, what we found is that the curses are always linked to the living. It's about experiencing life in a cursed state. Now, the consequences of a curse being in a cursed state may lead to death, but the curse is definitely attached to the living. I also just want to quickly point out, no, people need to notice how the menorah branches connect. You're going to see some really neat connections, hence the color coding on these judgments. Nice. Okay, so the first one of these is the creation judgment. Okay, this is going right back to the garden. We've got this. This is the first death. Okay, so we're, death is coming in to these unfallen, uh, you know, powerful 
sentient beings. You know, we call Adam and Eve. And what's interesting here, though, is that in a chiastic structure, the outer branches link, don't they, Michael? So if we were starting, you know, going right to left, if one was the creation judgment, the link in the chiastic sense on the outer branch here is the last one, mm -hmm. which, of course, in scripture is the great white throne. So in a chiastic sense, you've got in this reverse, sense, you've got these two that are connected. What's going on there, Michael? Well, you people have to think thematically on these things. So what happened at the creation judgment? You have mankind going from a glorified state to a fallen state. But what do we have at the great white throne? This is the end of t like the time domain. There was sin and death will be thrown into the lake of fire. You, you're almost having the opposite happen, going from creation, the, the, the cosmos, as it would say in the Greek, going from a fallen state. It, it, again, there's no more quarantine. Yeah. So we've got these two great biblical judgments. We're starting with the fall in the garden, but we're finishing with the great right throne. One is the first death and one is resulting at the end of it, the second death. Interesting. There's an interesting connection there. So this whole thing in the time domain is starting with these great biblical judgments that are going to both result or end in death. Next on the second, so we come in a bit. And we've got the second and third. So the second branch is now being connected. You know, we call it, we've labeled it the sixth here. The second one is mankind, the great flood. Think of this as the flood judgment. Interesting, this is being connected. Okay, so you got this judgment occurring on the nations. <laughs> what we find on the sixth there is one of the great judgments, biblical judgments of the sheep and goats or the nation's judgments, which is going to occur at the return of Messiah uh, following the fulfillment of Yom Kippur or Kippurim. So we've got this, this reality of this connection that's going on that both seem to be related to the nations or mankind, Michael. Absolutely. And one thing that we spotted in our swim, just as an aside, is that what happened that resulted in the in the flood you know they were getting up to all kinds of monkey business you know playing with the blood and playing with the dna and all these you know nephilim running here and there and everywhere now what are we seeing uh in the leading up to this judgment should we say we're, we're seeing the same type of behavior you know look around you know trying to inject things into the blood you know messing with the the genome you're seeing echoes of it again which is really interesting knowing where we're going to yeah and then we get this interesting thing going on here there's this scattered tribe business this divorcing of you know within the breaking of the condition of the house of israel and these 10 northern tribes and they all and then yehuda and a little bit of the ben benjamin and the, the levites are gonna you know be a part of holding the fort if you will until the coming of messiah and there's this interesting connection because, wait a minute, this has to do with his house and his people and a redeeming, a restoration, but also a bridal selection is going to come from the restoration of this house. And so this becomes very fascinating how the next great biblical judgment in relating to the spiritual adultery of a people that were um, adulterating against the Torah as such, there was a judgment that came down and there was a breaking of a condition. And, the, and they were removed from the house. Well, this is one of the great biblical judgments, Michael, that has often been missed. More on the Christian side, you know, but not so much in Judah and, you know, the say Hebrew roots, Messianic stuff. But then how that's viewed can be all over the place again. Um, but this was one of the things not talked about on the Christian side of the bank when I was, you know, uh, you know uh, coming to the understanding of the faith i was never taught of a great biblical judgment on the house of israel that wasn't really it, it's almost like it didn't matter in the sense of the christian journey and yet you start to realize wait a minute this not only matters this is forming one of the major central judgments that is going to give us the foundation as to why we're going to see messiah pay a price and need to pay a price for his people Without this great biblical, and so 
it kind of almost got skipped over. Um, and of course, then try to understand how this would relate to a bridal position. If you've left this out, especially from a Christian sense, they're all over the place with the understanding of the bride of Messiah. And I have seen the, the, the naivety now that I see in the Christian side in relationship to understanding the bride of Messiah is astounding because they're not on the foundation. They're not on the rock. They're on the sand. There's lots of truth in the little bits of sand, but that rock is not cohesive. And so every time something comes along new, some new wind of doctrine, a storm in their life or whatever it is, the whole thing crumbles. Everybody forgets sand is rock. It's just little bits that aren't, that aren't working together very well. You know, and until you have something to bring that together to harden, to be able to make the cornerstones and whatnot. And so this is a very interesting thing. So again, you'll notice this, but then the next great one is the fulfillment of something, Michael. And we've put here, you know, the bridegroom judgment. Did Messiah have to endure a judgment, a consequence? Did he have to pay a penalty? You know, this is what we're kind of alluding to here. Yeah. And it's and, and the reason why we're going to look at at least the foundation oh, part of this teaching as we move forward over part two and three and maybe a part four is it's very important that we don't confuse judgments. And so the one of the reasons why I believe the father gives us a chiastic structure, why he wants us to understand things in a certain way and how he connects and how Hebrew you know, thinking is building, you know, command on command and to have this cyclic thinking, you know, to be able to do that. But what we entered into was then we take that and we took, we go here a little, there a little. And that's our problem. This is the warning of Isaiah. We took that to a different, we, we, we used it or mishandled it. And so to try and get back to a cyclic Hebraic thinking where they are actually, it's not been there, done that. There's a picture building. It's like, Michael, I guess you say the way, you know, we get all these, you know, all millennial, pre-millennial, all that kind of stuff, you know, you know, futurists and all this kind of stuff. You got all this stupidity going on in the body. And I go, okay, let's go back to Adam and Eve. And everybody just like, doesn't matter what your position is in your eschatology or your understanding of biblical hermeneutics. And I go, okay, so we're back at Adam. Time domain starting. We all agree on that? Yes. Okay. Everything at that point is future. <laughs> so everybody at that point is a futurist. What actual Hebrew thinking is doing is as the great plan of redemption has moved forth and has gone out, and he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What we're left with is we've got a little bit left in the glass. There's a little bit of futurist left. You see, we try to go, it's this or that. I compartmentalize, do this, do that, and break it all up. And it's like, no, no, there's been a plan marching. And now we've got a little bit of futurism left in the glass, and we're right at the end of the age. <laughs> and so we got, we, you know, we, we got a sip left, you know, of this incredible cognac, you know, a spiritual cognac that has its left, and we're getting to that, that place. And, but we're having these arguments, and it's like, no, no. This is how it actually works. And so we've learned our eschatology, our thinking has been impacted by all of this. And so what we're trying to do is to make very clearly, we're about to talk about a judgment that is finishing the time domain. And what possibly would be its point? What does it mean? How is this going to be done? Elohim is a righteous judge. How does he, what is his understanding? How does he view righteousness? How does he pour forth righteous judgment as an Elohim while having us in the time domain in a test. And so all of a sudden, all our religious dogma has got to go because our head is just screaming with a bunch of noise trying to ask these questions. So we're trying to lay this out to say, listen, we're going to be talking about something that is not this. It's not that. It's not that. That's been, you know, it's okay. Let's not confuse this in scripture. How were they actually viewing things? Because 2000 years ago, when we got this thing, this testament, this thing we call the New Testament, this testament of the prophets and the Torah and, and its reliability, its fulfillment, it's all of these things going, man, we're here. Well, by the time we got to that point, you know, with the bridegroom judgment, all of these other judgments had occurred and, the, and, it's, and it's moving forward. And so what are we actually looking at? here and how are we supposed to view it so we're just going to start off here at the creation judgment and then we'll continue off in the next parts uh to finish off looking at this under a chiastic structure but we're going to kick this all off for this first teaching we're just looking 
just quickly at the creation judgment. It says here, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now, every one of these judgments has the blessing of death. Now, I find it interesting <laughs> that, that the adversary is going, no, 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 you're not going to die. So there's got to be, it's interesting how something's been reversed in our thinking. The adversary, is he lying? Is he telling the truth? What's going on? He says, but for Elohim knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like Elohim knowing good and evil. This is this partaking of good and evil. Michael, what's going on? Well, when you actually read it, you know, for the best part, the enemy, the way I put it is that he didn't lie. He may have bent the truth a bit because Eve did say, well, we can't even touch it. And he's like, really, really? Okay, touch it. You will not die. And then, as you said, in the design of men and women teaching, that then allows the door for her to question the rest of the commands. And so he wasn't outright lying, but he, he was being crafty, as the word says. He was he was manipulating and, and presenting the truth in a certain way that was very deceptive. Absolutely. And if you partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what Ha Satan is doing is trying to comfort her. She doesn't see death as a theory to her right now. But what we don't understand or what we've not traditionally been taught is that he's actually speaking against the blessing there. Because if you partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the blessing is the death judgment. That is not how we understand things traditionally from a Western self-based type of religious self-preserving perspective. And yet Hasatan is literally doing this. Now, if she didn't die after partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Eve is in big trouble. Serious trouble. And in fact, right now, we, again, we spoke about this earlier. If none of us could die in this world right now and the madness we're seeing was allowed to continue and we couldn't die, we'd literally be in an absolute horrific existence. The other side of the coin is if Eve was not able to die in her fallen state, she would be permanently separated from her husband because the fall re resulted in them being kicked out of the garden. Well, if Eve has fallen and Adam isn't, there's a bit of a divide going on. Problem number two. Exactly. Okay. You read this one, Michael. Yah Elohim said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go dust, you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay. I'm going to take the first part of this and you're going to take the second. This is what happened in our dive, just to let people have an understanding of this. One of the things that is often missed in the first part of this, cursed are you above all the livestock. So there's a judgment happening first and foremost to the adversary. Cursed are you. Now that curse is going to relate to something very interesting that's often missed here. You're going to go all at your belly. In other words, you're going to have to do this underhanded. You're not going to be able to use your beauty in the same way that you're done to fool Eve. You shall go in the dust you shall eat. Now, this is interesting. This is where you get the term, you know, underhanded belly, and all this kind of stuff, deception, right? So basically, you're going to use deception. You're not going to be able to use your beauty. But look at this. There is a judgment being handed down immediately here to something because the second death was going to be faced here, ultimately at the end of this whole chiastic structure, this connection of the biblical um, judgments at least these key great biblical judgments that involve this blessing of death. Now, what's really interesting here is all of a sudden, Hasatan, this immortal being, is being pronounced something. All the days of your life. 
suddenly we've got something that's going to have a time domain. And do you know at the end of this, apparently, when he's cast down into the time domain, he knows his time is short. All of this is language of saying, you're heading for the second death, Hasatan. And it's captured right there in Genesis. There's a judgment coming down immediately upon the serpent here. And we miss it. He's suddenly going to face death. Now, this is an incredible thing because Eve was facing it up until this point. We speak about this in the, the name, but um, Michael, I'll let you address the second one here because it's an incredible thing captured here in Genesis 3, 14 and 15. It's a stunner. Well, the, the modern way of putting it is your days are numbered. That's what Yah is saying to the serpent. Cursed are you, your, your days are numbered. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a really interesting thing and um, where it says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is in link to the offspring or actually the seed of the woman. Um, now, we're going to delve more into this into the second part and get into the Hebrew and what it's pointing to. But where it says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. When you actually look at the Hebrew, it's actually probably better translated, you shall bruise our heel. There's actually a plurality there, and this is linked to the seed of the woman. Now, most people, you know, they'll say that the seed of the woman is the promise of Messiah. Yes, that's one aspect to it, but it's not limited to just that. We know that uh, Messiah will have a seed, you know, and the seed didn't stop with Messiah. You know, there's... Um, and the word here for heel is akev, which is the root word for Jacob. You know, so right here, you're getting these little hints that there's going to be a seed. It shall bruise the head of the serpent, singular. One of them shall bruise the head of the serpent. But the serpent shall bruise a plurality at their heel. So is it speaking of Messiah? Absolutely. But is it also maybe speaking of the house of Jacob, the house of Israel? And we'll delve more into this in part two, but we're just trying to sow some seeds. And really, the thing to take away here is there's a plurality there. You shall bruise our heel. And that plurality is being linked to a second death judgment of the adversary itself. So we've got this really interesting connection chiastically with the great white throne judgment. And yet we see a hint to plurality. Why? What is going on here? And so we, there's a really interesting connection here between these, the beginning of the death judgments and the end of the death judgments. And in, this, in the Torah, in this small little spot, we see a judgment that is relating to second death to an immortal sentient being at the time that's an adversarial role. And we're seeing a plurality being hinted to as to its job. And there's a connection to the final judgment here, chiastically. And we're going to continue to build that picture. It's important that we understand the Torah is literally pointing us to something in reverse through Messiah. And this is really, really important because it's not doing this to confuse us. It's doing this to give us an understanding of his great plan of redemption and where it's going and why all of this must be and why actually the blessing that the father put in as the consequence of a transgression of partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was actually done in love. I'm going to suggest to you that no Judgment, biblical judgment that has ended in death was ultimately not love. But it's how we perceive something in our modern Western mindset that we've got to fight because the noise is screaming in us. Because Another for story. us, sorry, Michael, you go ahead. Oh, no, you finish your sentence because I, I was just going to give another seed. Oh, do it. Well, one of the key, you know, we, we like to talk about context. And one of the things is who said it. Now, you, people have to ask themselves, who said what we've just read? It was Yah. So again, bear this thing of Yah speaking and Elohim speaking, declaring something, and there's plural, uh, plurality involved. But keep this in the back of your minds for next week. Yeah. 
And one of the things, um, and again, some of the lead up teachings that uh, Michael's been doing and I've been doing and the, the design of men and women was a lead up teaching to the great white throne judgment. How do those two possibly connect? Well, it's actually through the Torah and understanding the design of men and women and whatnot, because this is going to be a big deal because there's a shadow picture given to us in the, in the time domain, in the fallen state through this thing we call a marriage covenant that's under attack, that is teaching us something as a part of his great plan. How does Elohim view the reason why we're here right now, stuck in this time to me? And so this whole thing of, I've got rebellion or love. And if you've seen the design of the men and women teaching, you'll see where I believe that we've been literally been taught a different understanding post the death and resurrection of Messiah. Not, we've been given an understanding that was certainly not what the disciples held and their understanding of the Torah as it related to what really went down in the garden. So anyway, if you want to go back, go back and relook at this as, the, as a part of this lead up to what really happened here. Because this is fascinating as it relates to judgment that will ultimately, at least chiastically, point to the last judgment we will ever face in the time domain. It's a big deal. We'll continue to build that up. But understand the design in the men and women teaching up to the point that I took it was a segue to this. In, in certain ways. Eve was facing the second death. And I, I mentioned that. If Adam just says, I'm out of here, Eve's done. Now, this is something that we all have to face. She's gone. She's going to face the second death. If Adam says, no, nope, you're on your own, Eve, it's over. Start over again. Here's another rib. Use this rib this time. That one didn't work out so well. You know, like, like it's, it's, it's like, what do we expect Adam to do? What did we see was actually going down? And I, later on in this, I'll give the, you know, the, I do a whole parable of the speeding ticket to really understand something. However, Adam is not the ultimate hero in all of this because the whole plan of redemption is about Messiah, not Adam. However, if Adam and this event is, is the shadow picture of the one who is, and the one who is, is Yeshua Messiah, this is a big deal to pollute the waters on. Because it will chiastically destroy our ability to understand the judgments and their purpose. It will all fall down in the Torah. He went after polluting this one, changing it, violating it, ripping it apart, our understanding of it, so that we would not have an understanding of so many things following this. We don't even know how to view judgment in love anymore as a result of this, as it applies to Elohim. And so this whole thing was a part of reprogramming us the way Hasatan wanted us to. In the end, though, it was Hasatan in that garden that faces the second death. Eve isn't because of a decision Adam made. And so we're going to see how this plays out when we end up in this whole teaching, getting back to this great right throne and why this is quite incredible for us to understand. So again, we don't have to understand it all, all in one hit. We're just building this picture and going, this is bigger than any of us may have possibly believed as to what's actually occurring here. And why did the adversary go after this in polluting our understanding of his great plan of redemption? And he started in the Torah. And is it any surprise that he would do such a thing? Michael? Well, if the end is declared from the beginning, what are you going to go after? You're going to go, you're going to go after what happened at the beginning, or at least our understanding of it. And this is all we're seeing. Indeed. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to continue with finishing off the rest of the, uh, the structure and where this is going to go right to the great white throne. And then we're going to dive into that in part three and its plurality and where this is headed. So this is where we're going to finish up today. And we're going to do a Q and a, the reason for this is that it gets a lot to take in. And so we'll spend part two going through the rest of this chiastic structure as it relates to the great biblical judgments. Each one of them are important because we're going to arrive at a position where everything else is going to be out of your head screaming. And the only thing we're going to be left with as we head in to this last and great final day is that there's a great white throne judgment coming. Now, there is a sheep and goats nation's judgment coming before that, and there's a bridal judgment coming before that. So we are going to literally be working through all of these so that when we get to a discussion of the great white throne, that the rest of this noise is settled and that we can actually look at 
the great white throne judgment and its purpose without a lot of our baggage as such. Does that make sense, Michael? Yeah. Crystal. So anyway, um, we are going to leave it there and we're going to we're going to finish for today um, because there's just again, like I say, there's just too much to try and take in in in, in one in one take. Um, and again, we're all right. Well, we could go a little bit longer. Should we do one more? We could go a little bit longer here. I'm game. Is Are you game? game? I'm not sure if the community can hang on any longer. <laughs> no, they seem to be. Do we still want to keep going? We'll do one more in the in the structure. Okay. All right. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. We'll do we'll do the uh, this is a bit of a shorter one. All right. So we're at mankind. So the mankind, what judgment's that, Michael? Flood. Flood. The, na the, the, the nations. Think of it as the nations, the earth. Okay. Lots of stuff all around this, right? You know, but we're going to take a slightly different perspective and angle for the sake of, uh, of this teaching here. In better sheet or Genesis six, five to seven says this in Yah saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. So <laughs> the tree of the knowledge of good and evil seems to be being lopsided now. And we're missing a lot of the good side of it, apparently, according to the word. Um, so we're only getting the evil fruit off this thing at this point. So we're only about 1600 years, you know, since the original event in the garden. And uh, after 1600 years, we're, we're done, you know, roughly give or take We're it's only evil. We're partaking of, uh, we're back there now, you know, as Yeshua said, right. Just as in the days of Noah, we we're back there. Now our world is now back. We're only eating of the evil right now, generally. And again, we're generalizing because we're speaking of the state of the world and the state of his creation. But we're back at the point that what Noah was living, we're just seeing a modern version of it. And as doing so, we're seeing all of the same things that we're warned about. So we're back in this place. It's one of the greatest um, signposts is to knowing that we're coming to the coming or the second coming of Messiah as the line of the tribe of Judah of Yehuda. And so this is where we're at. So we're back to this evil continuing. A lot of you are watching the news. You're seeing what's going on with people. You're seeing mass psychosis. You're seeing all this stuff around. People are going crazy. It seems in the Michael. I said, you're just like, you're just shaking your head going, how the heck can they not see this? How can they not under like, like, how are they acting like this? Why would they think that to be wise? You've got to be, I mean, some people are pulling their hair out. And I know a lot of us in this community, you're just looking at it going, what am I actually seeing? What am I actually seeing, you know, reading the newspapers, turning on the news, jumping on the internet, whatever it is, what's going on? And Yah regretted at this point, as recorded here in the in, uh, in Bereshit, that he made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart, not to his mind, not to his chiastic structure of biblical judgments, <laughs> you know, his heart. This is a real statement of an Elohim going, okay, this is actually hard for me to look at now. Not, not that he's surprised, not that he didn't know we'd get here, but that doesn't make it easy at this point for him in, in witnessing the journey or the plan of redemption as it relates to the time domain. So Elohim's not taking pleasure in the fact that men's hearts now are continually evil. He says, so I said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds, the birds of heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. This relates to the wickedness and the violence of mankind at this point. There is a great judgment that's coming in, and he is not going, well, you'll get your compartments. <laughs> he is grieving at what participating only from the evil side of this tree of the knowledge and good and evil is producing to the point where the world's about to get a massive reboot. Michael? Yeah, and again, this um, 
I will blot out. You know, there's inferences here to being blotted out of the book of life. And when, again, when people remember the chiastic structure, the, it's the counterpart of this one would be the sheep and the goats judgment. Now, what happens to the goats? The goats are sent somewhere and it's very hot and it involves a second death. So again, you, you're seeing these, these things. But again, what's very interesting is that from this great flood judgment, eight people survived, a remnant, a very, very small remnant. Now, those of you who have seen maybe the Bitter and Sweet series, when we get into these things, again, what's the counterpart to this? You, you're going to have a, a, a mortal seed pool to the millennial reign as a result of the sheep and goats judgment. We're also told man will be extremely rare, rarer than the gold of Ophir. You, you're seeing the same typology. Uh, again, they, they echo one another. What's interesting here is, you know, I will blot out man. You know, of course, that allusion to being blotted out of the book of life. Because we know Yeshua died for the missing, you know, uh, the mark, the sin of mankind. It's very clear. It covers everything. So there's nothing that his blood didn't cover. So what's interesting here is the assumption is, is that you get removed from the book of life now. So it's not his blood that's on the stand. It, there's it's something interesting. There's sovereignty. There's love in the equation. There's obedience. There's all of these things that are going to now come into a picture here, which is really quite interesting. So Yah said, I will blot out man. Now there's that link that is going to head to something that includes a plurality in relationship to a throne. <laughs> so again, there's something here that's connecting in this chiastic structure that is referring to this blotting out that occurred back in the great biblical judgment relating to mankind. And yet we know that there's a blotting out that's coming. So there's something interesting here. And, and so what's happening? You mean you, you can be blotted out of the book of life? Eternal life. Is that possible? So we just hold on to that thought. These are so very serious for us to understand what this reboot meant, what it, what it signified, because this is a big deal. The whole earth was rebooted. I can't even imagine from a loving Elohim what he was looking at and to actually go ahead with what we read in scripture. We just loosely, oh yeah, that's the great flood and all those bad people, they all got killed and da 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 We don't think of them as friends and families and people who were deceived and, you know, doing things. We don't think of it as people with emotions and feelings and all that kind of thing. But don't think that that's Elohim's view. That's our view. And we may glibly refer to things like the great flood. And we have the luxury, all these thousands of years later, of doing that, at least for now. But I promise you, by the time we're all done all of this, they're not going to be referring to the end of the age glibly. Any more than we should be referring to the great flood glibly. Oh, but I'm not doing that, Curtis. Oh, yes, we are. We have no clue to the degree of violence, wickedness that was going down, nor the hurt and the reality of what our Elohim was living to actually carry out this part of this great biblical judgment. We really don't. And it's okay. We don't have to sit there and pretend that we do. We're not Elohim. He viewed it from a position. But we must understand when we read these words, it grieved him to his heart. It made him sad. Literally, he's grieving here. It's not fun for him. He's allowing it. It's going to be a part of something. But it doesn't mean he's enjoying this. Anybody who thinks that Elohim's enjoying this moment is some vengeful God throwing thunderbolts, you know, down at it. It's just a misrepresentation. The God of the Old Testament, you know. Well, the God of the Old Testament here is recording that he's in agony. This horrible, vengeful God. That you, you know, that people have been taught. Okay, we'll do one more. And that's it. And we'll finish off with the scattered tribes today. We'll get to the bridegroom. Okay, so we continue along. We're going right to left here. So we have one, two, now we're at three. Scattered tribes. This is the one now that most of us didn't really have, didn't think about much coming from the Christian side. Is that fair, Michael? 
Yeah. And it's the realization of the scattered house why a lot of us are here today at River Shabbat. And keeping things like Moedim and even calling ourselves Israel and things like that. <laughs> yeah. So we're all here, and this is a great biblical judgment that really was kind of skipped over, at least in a lot of our journeys from a religious dogma point of view. Jeremiah 9, 13, 16, we're going to read here. Mike, I'll get you to read this. And Yah says, because they have forsaken my law or my covenant that I set before them, I have not and have not obeyed my voice or walked in accord with it, but have stubbornly followed their own hearts and have gone after the Baals as their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus says Yah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, behold, I will feed this people with bitter food and give them poisonous water to drink. I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. What's really interesting is, again, it's the hearts being judged here. This is what happened with the great flood judgment. And it, you can even argue what was going on in Eve's heart, you know, which led to this deception. But again, here, you've got the heart judge being judged and also this spiritual adultery. They're going after their own things. They're being there on the throne. Elohim is not on the throne. No. What's very interesting is the bit of food and the poisonous water. I know. <laughs> As I was reading it, this allusion, you know, to the adulterous woman who's yeah. forced to drink the bitter waters. Yeah. And then, and then you play out even in the, uh, the, the shadow picture, the physical shadow picture. We've been scattered all these nations. We're all drinking fluoride in the water. We're all eating <laughs> garbage food. Like it, it's just, it literally plays out. You know, the shed, the physical is always pointing to the way to your matter, the spiritual matter. But what's interesting is that your fathers have not known. Jeremiah is writing this and he's, he's saying to you, you have not known these nations. It is clearly telling you this is outside the Middle East. They don't know. They say, they're saying clearly you, you've never heard of where you're going to be sent. Why? Because it doesn't exist yet as a nation it's not a recognizable thing to them and it's making that point you're going to be scattered to places that don't even exist yet your fathers have never even heard of this but guess what i'm sending the sword after you hmm. <laughs> and this is all to do with spiritual adultery <laughs> it's all about forsaking the torah the covenant like what's going on here why were we not taught this when it says the Elohim of Israel? Does none of this matter to us that there's been this scattering? Who are these people? Is it possible that all of us are here today gathering, looking at this, trying to revisit a few things because we're waking up and we've had an identity crisis. We've had a judgment. We're, we've, been, we've been birthed into a judgment for which we will die in order for this to all be reconciled. And that's a blessing. It was actually given in love. We read words like, I will send the sword after them and will consume them. That's that vengeful God again. If that doesn't happen, <laughs> we're in big trouble. Big trouble. What way am I to view this, Michael? Shall I view this as the bad, vengeful God? Or should I view this as the merciful loving judgment that must be in order for me to even experience a reconciled house which way do i view this well what i do know is that one brings life and one brings death and there's a way that seems right to a man and its end is death and the more i don't know about you curtis but the more we look into these matters the more you realize wow the enemy really has flipped everything upside down everything is flipped you know and this is what we were promised good will be called bad bad will be called good and you know death we see death as a negative thing we see the tribulation as a negative thing and these are actually there for our sake yeah so we're marching through so we're going through this structure all right and so interestingly enough what we just you know, what we just discussed here is connected to what? So we've got this covenant judgment and it's relating to 
Oh, it's the fulfillment of something. It's something that's going to be faced by the same people that have been scattered. There seems to be an event in the appointed times in the structure of the Moedim, the things we were never taught to look at. There's an event where his people, after they have died by the sword, after they've been consumed, after they've gone through this, apparently if they're alive in Messiah, they're going to be raised up. And what's very interesting is that in this judgment, uh, judgment number three, the judgment of the house of Israel, the, the result of it is a scattering. Now, it, the one that is connected to is a regathering. Yeah, is the gathering. And this is uh, what we would say is the Bema seat, you know, the rewards and the losses judgment that this is connected to in the chiastic structure. So we were just discussing three here. And it's got this interesting link to this fifth great biblical judgment that is directly linked to the fulfillment of one of the appointed times. It's called Yom Teruah. And where his people that are raised as a part of the first resurrection are going to face a judgment. We're going to talk about that. Well, how does that relate to a blessing of death curse? Well, we're going to talk about something there when we get to and finish off, you know, the structure before we, you know, really now consider all of the learning curve and the pattern of something we're seeing before we discuss the great white throne. Remember again, how we started this off today. We cannot go beyond the discussion of the great white throne in the time domain. Everything else is beyond our pay grade. We've been up to, you know, what is written, what is mentioned, what is understood. There is going to be this great white throne judgment, this great judgment right at the end that is going to finish off the time domain and is going to finish off the reality of death. And death will be no more. So all of these judgments have played a role, have played a part of, there's an understanding as a part of this great test, this great demand. And so we need to understand how do we view biblical judgment through the lens of a vengeful Old Testament God and, you know, the loving blue-eyed, long-haired hippie Jesus, and, you know, and there is no judgment and everybody gets a gold star, you know, like, like you know, and that's how we're to understand or, or are we to take this thing, these words, these, um, this Hebraic lens, this context, and chew the cut on this and understand, because it's quite possible that if we don't do that, when we're discussing things like the final judgment, that we're just adding on a whole bunch of stuff that isn't, well, in fact, I'll be, you know, I know for me, you know, in my early Christian journey, if, if I discussed the great throne or the, you know, the final judgment of God, it, it, I, I don't know what wasn't imagination. To be honest, <laughs> and whether it had any biblical foundation to what I thought or believed it to be. All I knew is that I was fine. And all I cared was that I was fine, according to my imagination. And this is the thing that we need to also bear in mind is that these judgments is to enact his will. It's about, you know, like you said at the beginning, Curtis, it's his will, his desire his dream, his plan of redemption, and we're a part of it. It's not about us. It's about him. We're just part of it. Yeah. Okay. We're going to end there uh, today as we uh, make our way through this uh, so that we can start to discuss an interesting allusion to something uh, regarding a plurality hinted right back in Torah and in Bereshit. Um, what I will do is... Um, is we are i'm gonna i'm gonna finish off here with with just just an interesting scripture that that sits here um as we finish off at least trying to bring this and where we're headed we're heading to revelation 20 uh 20 uh, 11 and there is an interesting sense of this you know again where we're going with this but it says this then i saw a great white throne in him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away, no place found for them. It's where we started in understanding this. There is a plurality here. How does the, how is this possible? At the end of all of this, 
that we're actually seeing something here that none of us can reconcile unless we understand judgment. We understand judgment the way he wanted us to, and therefore we can even possibly understand what would be the final role and play of the great white throne judgment. By the way, there's a blessing in us understanding it. I believe in his truth, a blessing for us in so many ways, more than we could possibly know if we just don't change things and we just accept how he's doing something. Because when I understood or started to understand, at least remotely conceive that my goodness, everything he's doing is in love. Everything he's doing is about achieving his great plan of redemption. He's testing, he's sifting. He's going to bring everything to its final conclusion, this incredible Elohim. When I started to understand it a little bit more the way he asked us to, right? When you start to do that, suddenly you're going, hmm, this great right throne thing and his righteous judgment and everything else, wow, this starts killing a lot of the traditional Christian arguments. All of this once saved, always saved, not saved, you're dead, I'm throwing you in Dante's Inferno, you're going to burn in hell forever. All of this stuff that came in with religious dogma. What is Elohim actually doing? And why would you possibly be hinting at some form of plurality when it comes to the final judgment at the end of the age? The heck's going on? And does that <laughs> rock your religious dogma? Or rock mine. <laughs> <laughs> And the other question is, do because we're hinting at things, because we also have to say, do we have multiple witnesses? I'm going to suggest we wouldn't be doing the teaching if we didn't. But again, like it, it challenges, it does challenge certain understandings. A plurality on the throne. We accept it in some places, but not in others. <laughs> no, well, and when, in fact, even in some, we won't. You just read Revelation. And three, one of the promises to the overcoming component of his kahal. I grant with you to sit with me on my throne. What does that mean? And is that only related to the millennial reign, even if you believe in the millennial reign? Or do we just chuck this stuff out? There's no last great day in his plan of redemption. Well, we'll just allegorize that. Oh, I don't know what it's referring to in, in Revelation 3, but I don't know. John was getting a bit carried away on the island of Patmos and you know, just started scribbling things for no reason. Or is there something that's going right back to better sheet and Torah and it's being built through a structure? And in fact, is the confirmation and the understanding of this supposed to be built on a foundation, command on command, not here a little, there a little? Were we always supposed to have learned something a certain way? I'm going to suggest to you that I believe Paul, and so does Michael and any other things here, we are astounded at perhaps how this man truly looked at the faith. And there's no wonder why so many Christians and Hebrew rooters and, and, and our Jewish brethren twist his words. They did not have his comprehension. We can't stress this enough. To think that they do is now the folly of it. Whenever I hear people throwing Paul under the bus, I'm just like, <sighs> to where is our arrogance gone? Is it really possible that this man, maybe 2,000 years ago, who was used so incredibly as a part of this massive plan of redemption and getting us an understanding and awareness, is it just possible that he knew more than we did? We'll give it the lip service. Yeah. The best part. Yeah. Anyway, let's finish there. Um, and, uh, and we get to get in and continue our journey. We're starting with Messiah next week. Now we're going to get into the bridegroom judgment. What is this? Because everything's going to point to him in this chiastic structure. Wow. Where does this go? How important was this? You know, we've been learning certain things about this, but man, could it relate? Michael, could, could the bridegroom's, judgment actually relate to the great white throne judgment <laughs> could there possibly be a connection here well and i will say what you know people are probably thinking the messiah being judged what are you guys talking about hang in there guys hang in yeah, there. hang in there yeah don't don't worry if there's something in you that's going crazy right now that's okay 
but let's just hear a matter out. One of the worst things we can do is scream before we hear a matter out. Has anybody here ever reacted to something before hearing the other person out? And then once you actually, and then after the fact, you're like, oh, okay, maybe I could have listened a little bit longer and that might have spared my reaction. What we're saying is very important as we continue along. Just keep doing it. Just, just keep going because you might find some things are going to get answered. Just keep hearing the matter out. It's folly if we don't. Okay, don't worry. Nobody's running anywhere. We have Q&As. We have the questions. We have his word. We have the Ruach. We're okay. Nobody here is throwing away the blood of Messiah or the Torah. We're just discussing what we're told to look at. And if we don't do that, I think we're being disobedient. I think he's wanting us to understand something that's been robbed from us. In fact, everything we're going, Michael and I both agree to this, don't we, Michael? We're not sharing with you anything. Not only is it not new, nothing new under the sun, but we're going to go as far as to say that what we're talking about was an understanding at the given level of the Apostle Paul and the disciples. They understood this. We have been robbed of that understanding. There is, this is nothing new. It's possible. Does anybody agree? Is it just possible that we might not have the full perspective that the disciples and the apostle Paul and Yeshua had 2000 years ago, 2000 years later in the West? Is it just possible that we might not have it fully the way they did? And I would suggest to you, there's an adversary that didn't want us to, so that we could all be squabbling like a bunch of silly people right at the end while we've got the coming of Messiah. We're coming to the end of the age and look at what we look like as a body. And I, for one, want to be a, someone who wants to walk with others, who want to help others all repent at this time to turn to him now. You know, this really isn't about being right or wrong anymore. This is about our, our, have we been robbed of viewing and understanding things? Because I'll tell you, and, and, and um, Mike, I'll give you the last word on this today. Here's my last word. If you get this, my encouragement to the body is it all helps in our ability to turn to him and Teshuvah because it's sobering. It's hopeful. It's life-giving. What I found is, I made this statement earlier. We've made the faith all about us. I'm the house of Israel. I'm redeemed. I, you know, we're the favorite. I, 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 I. And you start understanding this and you actually start to care about your Elohim. Like, actually care. And you start to have a healthy reverence, but one from a place of love rather than fear, right? Because perfect love casts out all fear. And you just realize, my goodness, it really is all about him and all of these who's going to be the bride who's greatest all of a sudden it just it, it, it dissipates a lot of things dissipate things that you know we entertain and it, yeah it changes the heart i'll leave that's my last word it actually changes the heart and don't feel bad because the disciples had to go through walking with yeshua in person then they had to go through mucking and, and getting stuffing that up. And then they, and then they had to go through a, a death and resurrection. Then they went through a transfiguration. I don't know, and they're finally getting to a point where they're getting it. And they had and were raised on the Torah and the prophets. So the fact that we're in this, it's not a surprise, right? So we're not belittling our journeys and we're not mocking us, right? But, but don't let our pride stop us from thinking that we really are where they got to. Hopefully we're going to get to where they got to. Does that make sense? That's what we want to do. We don't want our pride to stop. We want to get who here wants to get to the level of understanding that the disciples got to and their love and understanding of this hope. Exactly. And, and, and that's the thing we don't want to be prevented of right now. We don't want that. We don't want that to stop us. Where's the enemy? The enemy is everywhere else. Or is the enemy in the mirror? The only thing that stops us from this is me. I look in the mirror and I go, man, oh, man, Curtis, you're going to do everything you can to hijack this. And Curtis is in the mirror doing this. And I'm going, well, I'm going to the Ruach. I'm going to stick the Ruach on you. And then what you do is you have others doing the same thing. And they're walking with you and walking with you. And this is hopefully what it's about now. Okay.
we can do this. We can do this. We can keep doing this and we don't have to get weird and we don't have to throw away the truth and we don't have to. In fact, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to test whether these things be so. We're going to look at these matters. We're going to go where I believe we were always meant to go. And we're not going to let Mystery Babylon rob this from us any longer. Amen? Amen.